Well, we're going to take a slight detour this Sunday. Um, I've had some conversations with some of you, and, uh, and I've seen a lot of care and concern expressed on social media from various people, with, which is, of course, completely understandable, um, as there's a lot of pain and confusion and misdirection and uncertainty taking place in our world. As a result, many don't even know where to begin regarding how to navigate life, and specifically um, what we'll be kind of broaching the topic of today regarding is how Christ followers are to approach the issue of politics in a God-honoring way. Now, don't go running away. This is not going to be a time spent where I'm going to tell you who or what to vote for, nor am I going to cast any shame on anyone, but rather... We're going to seek to do what we do every Sunday here, that we're going to learn, grow, and go. How? By looking at the truth of God's word so that we can live by that truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, because truth comes from God alone. And we're reminded of that in John 8, 31, where Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. See, as Christ followers, as the body of Christ, his church, we are called to impact our world and stand for and stand up for the ways of God with how we live. The truth isn't just for us, is it? It's for us to share with the rest of the world so they too can be made free, freed from the bondage of sin and darkness and brought into light and life. And you might wonder, well, what does this have to do with politics? Well, the reality is, As the church, we are called to go out and do what? Make disciples. That's the forefront of our purpose as the church. Once we confess our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are then to go and and help others do the same by telling them who Jesus is, how much he loves them, and leading them in his ways as we learn them. It's a share. You know, we learn, we share. We learn, we share. We continue that on in others. See, as disciples, we are students of Jesus and his word. And because it is truth that guides us in life, everyone needs that truth, right? So we should be sharing it. And if there's an opportunity through a vote, either for or against, or something of the sort to pave the way for that truth or to protect a truth already in place that is God-honoring, then we should do so. We are also called to meet the needs of people in our world. James 1.27 And I'm going to say a lot of scriptures today, um, and they're not all on the screen. So if you miss any, feel free to ask me and I can give you a list. But James 127 is just one instance of how we, the church, are to be involved in the well-being of people here on earth. James writes this, The pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. For the Christ follower, the understanding and balance of politics and faith has been blurred, marred, and confused over the years. Some take the approach to distance themselves from anything perceived as remotely political, and while others are borderline making it their religion. Neither of those are the paths that we should take as the church. It requires balance. And I want to make one thing abundantly clear. We, the church, Christ followers united together under the lordship of Jesus Christ should always and forever be unapologetically Christian in everything we do. Now, what do I mean by that? That does not mean to be unapologetic. It does not mean to to be a jerk and don't care how people receive it or perceive you. But rather, we can't let who we are in Christ, which we know that from here. There goes my pen. Um... We can't let who we are in Christ be put on hold in the name of politics or anything else. That might be hard because it's, what, countercultural? Jesus was very much so countercultural. And not for the sake of just being different, but because people weren't walking in the truth and Jesus wanted to set them free by leading them to the truth. See, church, we, where we have opportunity, we must take action. And yes, that includes doing our part in the political framework of our country by voting and thus representing God's ways and how we vote and through the things that we stand for, stand up for, and represent through how we live our lives as well. 
And this is fitting as last week we were in Genesis 30 to 31 and we talked about what integrity. See, we are first and foremost people who have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ through his finished work on the cross and just as he was raised up from the dead, our lives are raised up to walk in the newness of life. That's Romans 6, 4, which we often recall at baptism. That means that we live in a new, different way, right? Compared to how we lived before Jesus saved us. If he gives us new life, then how we live that life should be different than before because he's changing us from the inside out. So when it comes to politics, we often have an unhealthy view of how to approach it. So the goal today isn't to tell you who or what to vote for. I'm happy to have some offline conversations if you have specific questions about looking at things from a biblical viewpoint when trying to do your due diligence in voting. I wanna help you, pastor you through that. But here today, the goal and priority is to not answer every question because that's just not possible, but, but to bring our focus on where we can get the answers. That's Jesus and his word. See, including how to participate in our country's spiritual well-being. We're gonna be going through what I'm calling some filters today to help us know how to do that. But some of our unhealthy takes on politics might come across in ways such as these. Us versus them, AKA division. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today. We also falsely think that we can only do one or the other. Well, we can either be a Christian or we can be a political supporter, but neither or both, no. There is this thing called the separation of church and state, but that has nothing to do with Christians taking part in politics or not. We are called to partake in things in this world as citizens of earth, but here's something I really want you to hone in on. That must be properly framed into our reality and the fact that we as Christians are citizens of heaven and we must be heaven and minded in how we live here on earth. Look at the prayer that Jesus taught his followers in Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, since we are followers of Christ with our hope that we've been singing about today in heaven in sight, all the while currently still living here on earth, the way we live should reflect just that, that we belong to God and that since he has changed our lives, that must change how we live them. We are to live out heaven on earth, God's will being done in the here and now. We aren't supposed to wait to live changed lives until we get to heaven. It starts as soon as you give your life to Jesus. This is so important. Should we vote? Without a doubt. We should partake in things here on earth that God can use to benefit and protect and impact our fellow man according to God's goodness, the orphans, the widows, everyone, life. God values those things. And this, we should take action, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't also vote to try to protect or, or make new policies and people that will also champion those things in a different way. Should we vote for things that God approves of and vote against for things that God would disapprove of? Absolutely. We are called to uphold our morals, our ethics, our integrity in ways that are pleasing to God and his ways. There is a fine line though between living out our faith through voting according to our biblical ethics, morals, and integrity, and being divisive. We can kind of change directions quickly if we're not careful. So while we again should be unapologetic, not letting anything holding us back from representing Jesus in everything that we do, not just our voting, but we must also employ those things with great care, wisdom, and sensitivity. Yes, we should talk about them, but with care. And get this, we can accomplish both. And we're gonna look at some examples of how Jesus did that today. So as I was praying, the phrase we've all heard, that you saw on the screen a little bit ago, um, united we stand came to mind. But maybe not in the way you think. Um, this isn't about red or blue or Republican or Democrat, um, and not even country first. It's about uniting together under the name of Jesus Christ. Everything else in life should be subject to our allegiance to Jesus as Lord, first and foremost. And another thing, we've talked about this before, um, there are going to be people who disagree with us. There are gonna be people in this room today, maybe you're even sitting next to one of them, 
that don't see things the same as you do. And guess what? That's normal. But how do we navigate that? Do we make people sit on different sides of the room or make them wear red or blue shirts to easily identify the differences? Of course not. So what is the purpose of our discussion today? What is our goal? Let me say some things that's not about first. This is not about, one, trying to make anyone think like me. It's not about trying to get clones or parrots that just mimic what I tell you is right or wrong. In other words, this is not a do as I say because I said so at all. I have no intention of telling you which bubbles to fill in on the ballot, but I also want you to hear this. I do care how you vote, that it reflects God's passion, truth, compassion, plan, purpose, and will. Even if you would blindly do what I tell you to do, which I don't recommend doing for me or any other person, that wouldn't be authentic or genuine. God wants us to be authentic to our core with how we live. See, I care more about more than just how you vote and live. I care about why you vote, how you vote, and why you live, how you live. I want you to do what you do, not just because someone tells you to or because you feel it's what everyone else is doing. I want you to do what you do because you want to live and breathe the ways of Jesus in everything you do, politics included. So my one desire of this discussion is that each of you, myself included, would walk so closely with Jesus that he affects and impacts how we live our lives in every single area. And that includes our actions and choices within the political realm. Quite simply, today's message aims to remind us that the purpose of being a Christian in the world we live in is to live according to the principles and practices of Jesus Christ and loving, lovingly leading others to the truth that Jesus is and represents. And here's why. Because God cares how you live, and so do I. But you choosing to live a certain way is a personal thing that only you and God can work out together. I can't make your decisions for you, nor do I want to. I want to point you to truth. I want to show you how. And again, I'm more than happy to answer questions that you may have about how do I walk this road biblically in a way that's pleasing to Jesus. And that's what I want you to do. I want to lead you to Jesus. I want to lead you to the source of truth. Because Jesus is the only one who can help get your heart right before God, which will then affect your outlook which is also called your worldview on life and consequently how you live that out because you are a Christian. One thing, more thing I want to make clear. I'm not doing this because I want anything from you. No, I want something for you because I believe that deep down each and every one of you desire to walk out your life according to the faith that you have placed in Jesus Christ as your Savior. But if we're honest, sometimes... That's hard, isn't it? It can be difficult. Well, which way do I go? How do I navigate this? Being a Christian, bottom line, should impact everything we do, and that raises the question, how do we know how to make the right godly choices in politics or in anything else in life, for that matter? So that's going to guide our focus today. So our goal today is to come together as the church, united in him and letting him lead and us to do things in ways that honor him how we live, how we speak, how we vote, how we do anything. What matters, you ask? Well, God says what matters. Truth belongs to God, and we need to honor, live by, and share the truth of Jesus Christ. The Bible is God's word to us, and since it's God's word to us, when God speaks, we should listen and not just listen with our ears. He doesn't waste words or breath. He speaks with the intention of us responding in obedience to his word because he wants to lead us and others into life. And that, my friend, should absolutely influence everything we think and do. You could even take the word politics out of this because it is how we should lead our lives. We shouldn't be different in the, just because it's called politics um, as Christians. We should live this way and everything. That's integrity. We're focusing on politics right now because we're in this season, and again, because there's a lot of division, there's a lot of hatred kind of getting spewed by people from one side of the fence to the other. We shouldn't partake in that. We should come together and and love and lead in the truth. So we're going to look at a variety of scriptures today that point us down the right path for this to help us honor God first and foremost. So our big idea today is this, that everything we say and do in life should be filtered and funneled through God 
and his word to us. So Lord, would you help us to do that? It's not often easy. There are people whom we love that may have differing opinions. And God, we can sometimes get frozen in that because we don't want to offend or hurt. But Lord, help us not ever let that hold us back from doing what we are here to do, Lord. We are to, to represent you in all that we do, Lord. The truths that we stand for, the actions that we take, Lord, so that this world can be set free from the bondage of sin. Truth does that. And so, Lord, help us to honor the truth that comes from you and you alone here today and, and moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, that question, how do we know what to do? Where do we start? The best thing that you can do with anything when you want to get answers is to what? Go straight to the source, right? What do I mean by this? Well, you probably get the gist, but in order to really know something, it's best to go straight to the source. Um, if you ever question that as the best practice, um, just ask a bunch of middle schoolers um, to get some facts, and they'll all say, well, he said, she said, and I heard this. No, go straight to the, the source. God is our source. His Bible, his word to us is our source. That's where we should run for all the answers to life. And it requires, therefore, that we commit our whole lives to learning it and then walking in obedience to what we learn from it. This keeps us honest, doesn't it? By staying in check with what God teaches and and helping us only then sharing truth with others. There's no doubt that our nation and world needs wisdom and guidance. Oftentimes the problem with politics is that we tend to focus on people and policies rather than the truth from the Lord of heaven and earth. I'm not saying that people can't make choices that are wise and prudent according to God's standards, but we can easily miss the mark if we just hone into platforms and personalities without knowing where God stands on specific things so that we can then compare them with the people and the policies that they promote. And if we're not careful, if we're not looking to truth, if we're not going to the source, then we can also let our emotions drive us. If we only base our decisions off of our feelings, then that can get dangerous quick because there's no standard to our emotions if left unchecked. Are we checking our thoughts, our feelings, our actions with God and submitting them to him? That's so important. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. We are called to be godly counselors as the church. And we can do that in politics by sharing with others the truth of God. And additionally, we need to pursue, strive for, and preserve righteousness in our world. No, we can't force people to lead righteous lives, but we absolutely should model and aim to point the way to righteousness is for others by uplifting and upholding the ways of Jesus all around us. See, we can't be godly counsel if we're not being counseled by God. So that's important. And then Proverbs 14, 34 says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to many people. We as the church, as people who have been radically changed saved and renewed through Jesus' death and resurrection, should want new life for everyone, not just ourselves. We don't want to sit idly by hoping that those who are hungry will come to us. We need to go out and represent and share and spread, shine that light, spread that truth, be that salt, and represent Jesus well in all that we do. If we don't, then our nation will continue to suffer the fallout and aftermath of sin. So let's lift up and build our nation up in Jesus rather than to just watch it be torn down. So again, how do we do that? How do we know what to do? Where do we stand? By filtering it all through God's word and will. In other words, in the political lens, when we come across an issue or a person Filter through God and his word. Does this person, this policy, this issue, does it reflect God's ways? If you're unsure, read the Bible. If you're still unsure, ask people who you trust who know the word to kind of pick their brain about it. But always filter it 
through God's word. What does a filter do? How do we filter? What's the point of that? There's a lot of different filters that we may know of in life, right? Water filters, oil filters, air filters, and everyone's personal favorites, spam filters. They remove the impurities from something, something that doesn't belong, so that what remains is pure and good, sustainable, healthy, something you want. Gets rid of those things that don't belong so that what remains is only what you need and nothing else, and it's beneficial. Uh, I am guilty beyond guilty of being a water snob. Um, I don't like water at a lot of restaurants. If they smell and taste like bleach, I might get that stuff away from me. I don't like tap water. I'm big on filtered water and it has to be ice cold. Uh, we get our water here at the church for tea and coffee and at our house as well from water to go in Aberdeen. Super great tasting. If you've ever seen it, they have this huge filtration machine in their building that does all these different types of filters and reverse osmosis and things to take water that doesn't taste very good and make it incredible, right? Tastes way better. I don't want to drink water that tastes bad and has impurities in it because that's going to have things that I probably don't want to be putting in along with some of might be good, what might be good. But it can also cause problems if it's not purified, if it's not filtered. So when it comes to our lives as Christ followers, for starters, everything we do with our lives should be filtered through this. The fact that we are Christ followers who are sinners that have been saved and set apart, called out of death and darkness and into life and light. That truth must affect how we live, plain and simple. Because being a Christian is more than just wanting to be in heaven. It's about living our lives, our changed lives in the here and now. Because again, we are citizens of earth, but our final address is in heaven. So we need to live like it now. And we can. So to help with that, we're going to look at three primary filters of how that should unfold and be present in our lives. Because regarding the Christian and politics, it's all about being a Christian here on earth. That might sound overly simplified, but we miss the simple so often in life, don't we? Since there are needs presented in politics that Jesus cares about, we should care about them as well. We need to know how to navigate those things and those challenges. So let's look at those filters. The first and the most important is this. Does it honor God? This is first on purpose. It should be the filter that everything else passes through. If it gets caught in this filter of does it honor God, thus failing the test of honoring God, then stop right there, throw it out. You don't want anything to do with it. But to figure this out, ask some of these questions. Does it align with God's call, will, and morality? We looked at James 1.27 earlier. Children, orphans, widows, keeping ourselves unstained. Does this vote align with that or not? If it doesn't, then don't touch it. Stay away from it. Go the other direction with it. Vote no if it's something that supports something that is anti-God. Again, go straight to the source. The best thing you can do is ask directly the person that you need to know. If, if you heard something about one of your friends, you're like, I'm not sure if this is true. The worst thing you can do is ask a bunch of other friends and just start spreading different things. You go straight to the source, you ask them. We should run straight to God when we are unsure. And that's the beauty of having the Bible, his word. We need to run it through this test of whether or not it honors God. Why do we need to do that? Well, our ideologies, our personal beliefs, our opinions and thoughts, they will be challenged when we consult the word of God because we are often wrong. The word of God is very clear about these things. Who we are, Genesis 1 through 2, we are created by God in his image. Two, so who we are and then what we did, we, are, we have sinned against God. We see that in Genesis 3. And because we've sinned against God, we are in need of salvation and we know where to go for that need. Jesus gave his life, John three sixteen, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that helps us to not suffer the death that was due to us because of our sin, but instead give us new life, salvation. And then how we live after that salvation is also important and laid out in his word. There's this thing called sanctification. 
It's a fancy word that describes how we as Christ followers are continually being made holy and being purified all the days of our life here on earth. That fits right along with being filtered, right? Because he is helping us filter out those things that don't belong and grow in the ways that we should. And that is an ongoing ordeal, that we are being sanctified. It's not a one-time stamp. You've been sanctified, you're done, there's no more growing for you. No, we always have things to learn. We always have things to grow in. It's where we begin growing at salvation and we continue to for the rest of our lives. We won't have time to do a deep dive into sanctification today, but um, here's some scriptures if you want to jot them down. Paul talks about it a lot. Romans 12, 1 through 2, of course, he talks about the, the renewing of our minds. Again, renewing, ongoing. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, but you are washed, sanctified, justified. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, he talks about sanctification through um, abstaining from sexual immorality and calls us to possess our own vessel in sanctification and honor. Meaning that our lives, our bodies, are meant to bring God glory and honor through, we, through how we act, think, and live. And God is the one who can make those changes within us and to be able to think right, to be able to live right. That's the sanctification. That's the grow part of our purpose statement, our mission statement, to learn, grow, and go. We go to learn from his word, and he grows us as we hunger and thirst for him, and then we can go and continue to share that truth with others. And if we, Christians, knowing the truth of God, need to continue to grow in it, then others need to as well. If it's an ongoing need for us, then others need help it with it as well. And if we can help people with what we've learned from God and his word, then we should take that to them as well, for those that don't know the truth yet. So when it comes to politics, that should be our first filter. Does it honor God? If the answer is no and it dishonors God, which we know by consulting his word, then it's not something we should support politically or take part in. Therefore, when evaluating a person or policy, we need to be able to look at it from God's point of view, first and foremost, to know if it's something that God would be for or if God would be against. Our second filter, which is almost the opposite of the first, we must be aware of our own shortcomings. Um, any, I mean, how many examples can you think of where you're like, well, I shouldn't have trusted myself there, right? If not careful, we can have this tendency to just decide on things without consulting God in his word and just go by our own logic or feeling. So filter two is, well, I think, dot, dot, dot. At first glance, you might wonder, oh, what's so bad about that? What's, what's wrong with what I think? And that's because we as the human race don't really like to think all that bad about ourselves. We don't like to admit that we could ever be wrong. We don't like to admit that we have room for growth, but we do. We are all sinners that have fallen short of God's glory. We all need God to help us think and live appropriately. Because of sin and our need for sanctification, there are some things that people might think that are good, that are actually bad, and some things that people think are bad that are actually good. It doesn't take long to find those examples in life and politics and things of the like. Careful not to misunderstand or misconstrue this here. Um, I'm not saying to hate anyone because they might think that way that's opposite of the biblical foundation and standard. Um, again, we are all sinners. Sin messes people and things up, resulting in people being further distanced from God and his truth and the reality of his commands to us. The reason that we can't always trust ourselves is because truth comes from God and it is therefore not subjective but objective. If truth were subjective, then we'd be able to decide what it is and what it isn't whenever we want. We unfortunately see that a lot in the world today, but that's not real life. Truth is objective. God set the standard and that is where it stays. It doesn't change. God's truth is always truth. But sin has caused those who don't look to God for truth to blur the lines and people are getting more and more confused and further and further from the truth. 
Isaiah 520 explains this so well. This is the human state, and it perfectly explains why we need to be saved and why sanctification is a real need in our lives so that we can properly represent Jesus in all that we do here on earth and why we need to be transformed, why our, needs, or why our minds need to be renewed. It's all a necessary part of how we are to reach the world and to stand up for God in all that we do. Isaiah 520 says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. How many people want a big old slice of dirt on their plate for dessert? Wouldn't taste very good, would it? Chocolate cake, on the other hand, you might like. But you can't confuse those two things. And this is literally what sin does. We call evil good and good evil, darkness for light, light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If I want something sweet, I want it to be sweet. I'm not looking for something bitter. That's why I don't like coffee. Even for the Christ follower who has been saved and is in the process of being sanctified, we can miss the mark and lose sight of things if we aren't keeping ourselves and our thoughts in check and subject with God's standards. Therefore, let us not fall prey to, well, I think, you might have heard the, the horribly misleading and untrue phrase, well, this is my truth. No, it's not. That's not truth at all. God defines truth. He sets the standard. We need to keep ourselves in check with that. That's why we need to be active members of our society to keep pushing for the things of Christ in love and grace, preaching truth, protecting life, fighting for the biblical godly values to remain. You might wonder, does it even matter what I vote for? Yes, even if you stand alone as the only person for godly truth and morality, it is worth it. Because again, it's first about integrity. We need to honor God with how we live first and then reach those who need led in the truth. Imagine if every Christian took a stand to go to bat for the things God calls us to. There'd be radical transformation and revival taking place. And one more filter, and I think this, this closely ties to the first, and this one's so helpful to get the order right on. Um, the two greatest commandments should guide our steps. I'm going to read from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Um, here Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees, and those always go really well. Um, it says, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. And uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't see eye to eye. They were on different sides of a lot of things. And so for the Pharisees to kind of be like, oh, Jesus is our common, common enemy, so let's come together type thing. One of them, verse 35, a lawyer asked him, Jesus, a question testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your what? Mind, heart, and soul, right? Your mind, that's your intellect, your intention. It's your thought, your understanding. Then there's your heart. It's the seed of feeling and impulse and affection and desire. And then our soul is our life, our living being. All three of those things must be united in order for us to be balanced in life. We must lead with our whole selves, not just our minds, not just our emotions, not just our actions. We need all three of those things to be united together underneath God. In other words, how we think, how we feel, and how we act should be done in a way that is loving and honoring towards God. That word for love is the one we talk about a lot. It's agape, others-focused love. This is the love that Jesus loves us with so much that he gave his life on the cross. His love does what? It takes action, right? And that word agape also means to be faithful towards. So we need to live. We need to take action. We need to be faithful towards God with our lives. We must first and foremost live our lives in a way that loves and honors God 
That's the most important first step that frames everything else into its proper place. Then second, after you have ensured that you are living in a way that loves God, then you love your neighbor as yourself. Again, that order here is paramount. We can't define what loving our neighbor means and looks like without bringing it underneath what loving God looks like. So important. Again, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with politics? Well, our love for God first and our love for our neighbor secondly should affect how we live and act in every realm of life. Again, we are members of a city, a county, a state, and country. As part of society, we must contribute in order to take a stand for God. We are his representatives. The Great Commission is the call of the church to go to the ends of the earth and share the good news. Tell them about the love of Jesus. And this, therefore, should impact how we vote because our vote should be marks of the fruit of Jesus' impact on our lives. So our voting, our political involvement, again, is not a separate, unrelated part of life because the policies and the politicians voted in impacts the lives of people. And we in the church must be willing to love our neighbor. And part of that is done through voting from a place of biblical wisdom and understanding, both to promote and protect God's worth, on, God's word on earth as it is in heaven. Great. What if you don't agree or what if they don't agree? And that's why I'm wearing this hoodie today. Um, just as a fun little silly example. Uh, if you don't know, I graduated from the great alma mater of Montesano High School. Go Bulldogs. Um, I have now two kids who go to Elma High School. <laughs> Monty and Elma, if you don't know, they're rivals to the end, right? So every year, my daughter Maya and I have taken a fun picture on the day of the Monty Elma game, which is in two weeks. Um, and her glaring at me and me smiling, pointing at the bulldog on my shirt, right? Um, but it's all a fun, silly little thing. You know, school rivalries, they're fun. Um, I love people at both, nothing like that. But it's just uh, a picture or an illustration. Just because we stand on one side, Monty versus Elma, doesn't mean that I should keep let that keep me from loving and caring them and getting them to go to a different school, but no. Uh, <laughs> see, our differences don't need to be a roadblock is the point of all that. And to help us have a healthy focus on the purpose of politics, they aren't meant to divide, even though they are often polarizing. We have to make a choice. Is it for God or not? But we can often find ourselves on different sides of some issues. There are some issues that the Bible may not explicitly speak to. You can be like, yeah, that's your choice. There are some that are very much so things that God speaks to and that um, are integral to the life of the Christ follower. But we can still love people that think differently while representing the truth to them and, and sharing, it, sharing it without being ashamed and unapologetic about it. So how do we share truth and show love with people who may not see it the same as us. Jesus is who we should look to for that and there are two great examples of many. First in John 4 and then also in John chapter 8. First, Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. I, I encourage you to go read these two chapters in John. Um, the youth are pretty well versed in this because we're going through John again, wrapping up chapter 10 tonight. But Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, First of all, she was kind of a social outcast um, because of her life choices and because she's from a woman and was Samaritan. So she's at the well in the heat of the day when she wouldn't have to see many other people. But Jesus approaches her with grace and love. He said, hey, will you give me a drink? See, he's not saying, stay away from me. No, he approaches her with love and then he also makes an invitation to her. He invites her to drink from the living water and to be saved. He reads her mail, but lovingly leads her into his grace. See, he knew what she was like, that she was living in sin and that she had had um, a lot of issues, that she had multiple husbands and was living with someone who wasn't her husband now. But he doesn't say, woman, you're dead to me. Get away out of my sight. No. He says, give me a drink of water. I'm thirsty. And then he turns and says, you know what? You're thirsty too. 
I can give you living water that can change your life forever. He doesn't deny that she is living in sin, but he also doesn't leave her there. He extends an opportunity, an invitation into grace and salvation. And then John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. This is something that really stood out to me this go around and looking at it. Every time you look at something in the Bible, even if you've read it a hundred times, something new can jump in and like, oh yeah, that's really good. Um, so it's good to read the Bible on repeat because you will always learn and grow in it. But he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. So all the Jewish leaders took this woman, put her in the middle of a big mob and said, um, you're gonna be stoned to death because you sinned. Um, the man's nowhere to be seen. He was just as guilty, by the way. But uh, what does he do? He doesn't condemn her. Everybody that he said, he who's out of sin, cast a first stone, they left. I get this. He loved her with grace, kindness, and truth, saying, go and sin no more. Do you realize that Jesus was the only person qualified to throw that stone, and he didn't? That's what loving our neighbor looks like. He upheld truth, go and sin no more, but he also loved her, I don't condemn you, inviting her into a life. See, we must take action. Making disciples. No action doesn't accomplish making disciples, loving God, loving our neighbor, and leading people to Jesus and his truth. We must fulfill the Great Commission, and part of that must be played out in the field of politics. That's how our system is designed. We, how can we ever make disciples? How can we ever represent Jesus to the people who need to know his truth if we isolate our from ourselves from those who don't yet believe? If we silo ourselves, only trying to focus on the comforts and liberties of the Christian and our freedoms for ourselves, but don't care about bringing them to the masses, that's not what we're called to do. We must be agape, loving, others-minded, honoring God and how we love others and bring them the truth. Who is going to minister to those who stay behind if all the Christians abandon them? That's why we must take action. Evading politics and action is not the answer. And neither is promoting division through politics. We can participate in a healthy way and still maintain our integrity without sacrificing who we are in Christ. So where do we go from here? The worship team wants to come. No, this doesn't mean that you have to become a lobbyist or a campaigner or even run for office in order to do things God's ways in politics. Maybe he's calling you that, I don't know. But the reality is that we as the church are called to influence the world for Jesus so that others can hear the truth and then have the opportunity to know the truth and be set free. We don't accomplish this through fights and arguments. It's done through loving God and loving people and lovingly leading them to the truth. It's not either or, it's both and. We can't just love, meaning uh, treat people nice and don't stir anything up and call it good. No, grace and truth are vital. We should vote and take action always in ways that honors God. We should love our neighbor who may not have the same outlook and attitude. Don't contribute to the division. Yes, you can stand united with God and still love your neighbor and lovingly point the truth out to them, just like he didn't condemn the women he talked with in the Gospel of John. Be real about where they're at and real about the answer because that's the most important part. That's where we want to get them to. So let's be real about God and how we do life in politics and everything else. I encourage you spending some time in prayer. Ask God, Lord, how can I better honor you in all that I do through my vote, through my speaking, through my living, through my action? If you run into questions and need help, get together with some people that you trust and walk that out. Get that godly counsel that we learned about in Proverbs. So Jesus, it's a heavy topic and a big one and, and lots of questions will always be there, Lord, and that's why we're looking to you for truth. Because, Lord, yes, we can give little tidbits and say, well, do this, don't do that, Lord. But the biggest thing is to lead people to the source, the one who will continue to guide us in truth, and that's you, Lord. We have a relationship with you so we can seek you first. Lord, we want to lead others into that relationship, too, so they can seek you and know the source, Lord. Rather than just giving them one drink of water, Lord, lead them to the, the well of living water that never runs dry. 
That's what we can accomplish through the love and action, Lord, even in the political front. So, Lord, help us, your church, to represent and honor you and how we love you and love our neighbor. We are called to both, and both are possible, and that all is subject and filtered through honoring you above all else. So help us to do that, Lord, in this upcoming election and in every action that we take as citizens of heaven temporarily here on earth to point others to you and your goodness and your truth and your love. In Jesus' name we pray.